Imagine your car breaks down in the middle of a rural road. As you wait, you start to realize that nothing out there is addressing you personally. The moon, the trees, the grass, and the insects are just there, unaffected by your presence. Nothing around was designed to prompt a predetermined reaction from you. A shooting star crosses the night sky. You catch a glimpse, but the instant you turn around, it has vanished. It's gone. It's real. You can't rewind, freeze, or slow it down. You have very little control over your surroundings. As you contemplate a crawling caterpillar, you become aware that your relationship with the rest of existence is far from evident. The incident is humbling. But these days, the opportunities to experience an unmediated reality are extremely rare. As media outlets diversify and get customized, each one of us is becoming the center of a personalized universe. Constantly being addressed by our environment, today, we don't want to contemplate the night sky. We want to be the stars. For centuries, only the nobility could document their lives. But photography changed all that, especially after George Eastman introduced the first mass-produced consumer camera in 1888. Since then, new technologies have emerged that make it possible for all of us to record and share our every move. The improved printing systems of the early 1900s triggered the proliferation of mechanically reproduced images. And as the number of organizations clamoring for popular attention multiplied, the lessons learned from military propaganda were promptly incorporated into commercial advertising. Since then, the communication channels have vastly diversified. Currently, the average person spends seven hours a day interacting with media and is exposed to over 5,000 marketing messages daily. Just like McLuhan's fish, we are too immersed in our own environment to notice it, but its effects are palpable. The internet and a 24-hour news cycle give us the illusion of knowing everything that happens everywhere, while new technologies like social media encourage us to compulsively define ourselves and create digital altars to the ego. Like gods, media seems to grant us omnipresence and omnisapience. But unlike the biblical god, we are mostly omniimpotent. We can easily learn about all the world's problems, but can hardly do anything about them. To cope with the cognitive dissonance of a media that simultaneously magnify and defeat our ego, we subconsciously reinforce only the aspects that make us feel important and powerful. We accomplish this by turning everything that happens in the world into a self-centered statement about our own beliefs and assumptions. But while these statements may do little to enact any immediate external change, they do much to transform our personal character and collective culture. Studies show that narcissistic personality traits have been rising steadily since the 1980s, with some psychiatric experts describing current levels as epidemic. While the causes for this phenomenon are diverse, mass media plays a big role. It breeds an environment where attention is perceived as the most coveted asset and where those who manage to attract it are idealized. As we increasingly venerate celebrities and strive to emulate them, our society is becoming obsessed with those who are obsessed with themselves. This trend is made evident when we analyze what is probably the most representative creative output of the last century. The blues emerged from the Afro-American spiritual chantings of the early 1800s. The field haulers expressed the hardship and injustice of slavery. Decades after the American Civil War, the cotton fields were alive with the songs of Charlie Patton, Ma Rainey, Lead Belly, Bessie Smith, Blind Willie McTell, Sunhouse, and Robert Johnson. 
Although he passed away at the young age of 27, Johnson is considered the grandfather of rock and roll. His songs went on to influence legendary musicians such as Muddy Waters, Led Zeppelin, Bob Dylan, The Rolling Stones, Jimi Hendrix, and Jack White. By the late 1940s, Woody Guthrie's songs emerged as anthems of the pro-labor movement. And by the early 60s, Dylan's Blowin' in the Wind was an anthem for the civil rights movement. By the late 60s, the music charts were filled with songs featuring social and political content. During the Vietnam War, hundreds of anti-war songs were released, and more than 70 made it to the Billboard charts, with 14 occupying a spot in the top 10. Artists expressed compassion and empathy towards the plight of others, and they were propelled to the top by an equally empathetic audience. On August 1st, 1981, MTV launched, and just as their first video predicted, the attention shifted from the art to the artist, and from the sound to the image. Pretty soon, the airwaves were seized by sexy girls and well-coordinated boy bands. Empathy, social awareness, and political dissent were gradually replaced with complacency, arrogance, and self-devotion. By the end of the 90s, the message was clear. Of course, pop stars have always been rather egocentric, but what about today's rebel poets? <clears throat> <clears throat> Slut, you think I won't choke no whore till the vocal cords don't work in her throat no more? 20 million other white rappers emerge, but no matter how many fish in the sea, it'd be so empty without me. This dude named Michael used to ride motorcycles. Dick bigger than a tower. I ain't talking about Eiffels. Real country ass nigger. Let me play with his rifle. Pussy put his ass to sleep. Now he calling me NyQuil. Never mind my money. Never mind my stacks. Every bitch wanna be me. You can find him in sacks. I like my house big and my grass soft. I like my girl face south and her ass north. But I'm Ray Charles to the bullshit. Now hop up on that dick and do a full split. She lick me like a lollipop, so I let her lick the wrapper. Call me so I can get it juicy for you. Left, right, back to the middle. Head on, swivel neck till I quivel. Open your mouth. Taste the rainbow. Taste my skittles. Ah, <sighs> pussy, pussy, pussy. This heavy crown, it comes and goes around. And when it's time, I'll pass it proud. But bitch, I got it now. Lamborghini Mercy, your chick, she's so thirsty. I'm in that two-seat Lambo with your girl, she trying to jerk me. I am a god. I am a god. I am a god. Even Britney sounds humble when compared to the cartoonish self-absorption and arrogance of today's hip-hop megastars. But while it's easy to ridicule the blatant egomaniacs who often occupy the top of the charts, it's harder to recognize that their popularity is truly a reflection of our collective dreams, aspirations, and cultural values. After all, if their message didn't resonate with the audience, they wouldn't be at the top of the charts. Without a doubt, there are still humble and empathetic artists out there 
but in general, their message does not thrive in today's narcissistic environment. Today, MTV has mostly replaced the music with reality TV, but its shows continue to glorify arrogance, ignorance, and materialism. This attitude is prevalent in most of the youth channels, where the emphasis placed on possessions goes beyond iced out kicks, pimped rides, and mega cribs. Women have become highly objectified and are portrayed as possessions as well. Many hip hop stars proudly proclaim to be pimps, often referring to women as bitches, hoes, and cunts. Some are directly or indirectly involved in the production of pornography. Their exploitative videos join the hundreds of thousands that inundate our media. A media where degradation, cruelty, and violence towards women are on high demand and on the rise. All I want for